Well, hello there, folks. I mean, I told you guys I would be here for a gear change. So, hope you guys have been getting ready, strapped in for uh, three for three parts of or part one of a three-part series that I'm going to be doing. And that is the turbocharged crazed F1 Group C and Group E era of motorsport and how they. Um, change the sport, how it kind of raised some safety concerns, and how it possibly killed off, and how it killed off two categories, and prompted them to change, um, and change the politics, and the way how we thought cars were supposed to be. So I'm going to start with Formula One first. Formula One's Turbocharged era, um, turbocharged era uh, started in 1979. Started in 77, 77, 78, 79. Um, so back in the late 70s, um, so back in the late 70s, um, a lot of a lot of teams were um, trying to find a way to beat Ferrari and um, also try to differentiate themselves from different uh, manufacturers. So different teams did different things. Um, and a lot of people thought, ha, huh, yeah, so... Because at the time, sports cars were, were starting to become turbocharged and turbocharged engines were starting to become a thing in the mid to late 70s. Um, uh, with the uh, Group 5 and Group 6 sports cars and open prototypes, but I'll get to that in my... That sort of that sort of lays the foundation for Group C um, that would come up in the early... Late 70s, early 80s, but I'll get to that in the uh so what if the fia decided to do the fia was like why don't we uh, why don't we introduce these rules for um why don't we allow teams to allow allow teams to do this for formula one uh at the time most um the grid of cars mostly comprised of um, V12s, flat 12s, and uh, v 8 So you had the flat 12 of the boxer flat 12 of Ferrari and Alfa Romeo, although they were the same company because they're part of the Fiat Group. Um, although Alfa had their had their uh, the boxers flat 12 had their thing. Um, Ferrari had that from had the V12 from uh, Ferrari had the V12 from. Uh, the um, 3.22 PD and they had that from the 312 well they had that and then they put in the car and you know the story about Nicky Lauda and um, the 1976 through 1979 world championships you'll know that they use that most and then on the other side of the grid most of the privateer, privateers like uh, Terrell um, Williams uh, and McLaren, a couple other teams, BRM, um, BRM had a, well, no, BRM had a V12, um, the one Nicky Lauda in the movie Rush famously modified and was, and had Rick and Sony go up and he was two, heads, two seconds faster, so. Uh, which is kind of a fast, fast tidbit right there. But most of them had the most of the privateers who had, um, as well as Lotus. Lotus was still on the grid in the late mid to late seventies. All had the Cosworth DFV. Now the Cosworth DFV was kind of the ubiquitous engine to have um, in the era, and it was one of many engines that were very successful in that era. Uh, remember, the Cosworth DFV has been has been around since the mid 60s so by the time 1977 rolled around um, 
a lot of the, and I think it was Matt Matra and uh, Rano, um, who had three liter, um, who I believe were using B of V's, and well, Matra was using their own B12, I believe, and the, um, and the V12s were, were didn't have the same power as the B of V. And they weren't able to keep up with the aerodynamics of the Ferrari, so they needed something to turn the tide. So, um, so at the time, uh, so 77, 78, 79, Renault actually wanted, but Renault sat there and said, huh, why don't we take a, why don't we take the um, two liter six cylinder engine and why don't we find, an engine that's one point that's like half a liter smaller so what they did was they took the Gardini Renault engine which was a six cylinder engine one and a half liters and they said let's just put two turbo let's put a turbocharger on it and they showed up with and Renault showed up with the yellow teapot look it up online it's the back end of the car is exposed the wings kind of weird um, Car made somewhere around 580. I think the car made around 650 horsepower, and this was about 100 and 100 plus more than what the DFVs, the Ferraris, and all those other cars were doing. But the problem with it was it was it was heavy and it was unreliable. But I think in 70, um, 78, and 79, they got around the problems and they started winning. Um, and then everybody just said that basically sat there and was like, okay, well, well, this needs to, this needs to happen. And it turned, it turned into an arms race after that. Um, Lotus would have Renault, um, would have, well, some teams like Tyrrell and, uh, and McWilliams, would still use uh, DFVs because they couldn't afford a, a turbo four cylinder or a six cylinder engine, and some of them still stayed. I think it was I don't think it was until 1981 or 1982, 1983 that actually all the teams went to turbos and stuff like that. And um, I'm pretty sure Ford came up with a Ford came up with one. Um, pretty sure Hart or Arrows came up with one. Hart came up with one. Senna's first Formula One race was actually in a hard-powered Coleman, Tolman. Tolman that was making 750 horsepower, I think, by the time the 80s rolled around. And then um, Renault was not having so much... Was having, the main Renault team was having, was having a little to no trouble. And then eventually Lotus got their hands on 1985, 90, 1984, 85, 86, got their hands on the 1.5 liter EF1 Gardini engine, put it in the back of uh, the Lotus 95, 96, 97, 98 team, and came up with some pretty cool things. Honda, Honda also came around. Honda also became ubiquitous. They powered Williams. Ended up Williams and Terrell ended up finding uh, the uh, Honda engines, and um, Ferrari was also in there, but not very successful. This was kind of one year where Ferrari really didn't score too much because their Tipo six-cylinder, and I think Ford was also in there with. I think Ford was also in there with. Um, was also in there with their twin turbo system um, but it was but it was by the mid 80s by 85 86 85 86 power outputs became a problem because the cars during the races in 1978 1979 1980 1981 all had around 650 700 horsepower by the early 80s um by the early 80s mclaren i think mclaren had tech cure and i think they eventually went to honda well i think they went to honda later um they started producing 
they they were it was such a special niche thing and the teams were spending so much money so what they did uh, to make qualifying more spectacular was Honda Lotus well William well Honda uh, Renault and um, and Ferrari and all the other teams and Ford used to make a special setup for qualifying for practice and qualifying so you wouldn't so if you watch any of the footage from um, from the late 80s uh, you'll know that Nigel you'll see photos of Nigel Mansell and the in the, in the Williams I think it's either the 14b or the 15b actually I think it's the 13 11 you'll see them in the Williams cars slipping and sliding that's because the cars had sticky tires it had a gearbox that was good for four laps the turbo was turned up to 11 and the and the engine was built to basically grenade after four laps how did they do this well they put a big turbocharger so two turbochargers the gearbox was was geared to just bang on shifts and the tires were meant to stick like glue and they had to because the cars were making at this point 12 to 1400 horsepower or whatever number they were plucking out of their out of their brains at the time um i'm pretty sure lotus made 1200 uh, i'm pretty sure honda was a little lighter but made about 1100 and 11 1250 they were always up one end of each other but no one had quite the game like um bmw and nick nelson pk and ricardo patrese had 14 oh yeah i think benetton had what did benetton have benetton and i think had ford um i think had ford at, ford at the time and they were and i think bmw was making 1450 1450 horsepower 1450 hp you heard me correctly and these cars were capable of over 225 to 220 miles an hour they were faster than indianapolis cars at this point would they be able to stay with an indianapolis car for four hours probably not they, for four laps they would during qualifying they would probably be able to do the four lap average but during the race i don't think so because during the race the cars had between I think BMW had about a thousand, Renault had about nine hundred, and Williams would always be at like a thousand or something like that, just a one up, just a one up. And Ferrari was always drifting somewhere with with Prost and Teo um or uh, or Johnny Dumfries. Johnny Johnny Dumfries would be in um, would be in the uh, Benetton, I believe. Um, and these cars were insane. These cars had almost 80 psi boosts going through these little one and a half liter, 1.4 to one and a half liter engines. Um, it's so technical that you could actually adjust the turbos, and you actually needed to adjust the turbos and adjust your driving style because there was no refueling. And that was because of some accident I think that happened in the 80s and some safety concerns. They didn't want drivers burning, burning up in the pit lane because these cars were so volatile. Um, these turbos were so red hot during qualifying they, they were afraid they they would burst into flames so and after a few nasty accidents and uh, a couple close calls and some really dodgy conditions and what weather driving I means I don't know how to knew how to horse uh, um, knew how to ride ride the uh, ride that Renault Lotus like a cowboy but and he was always on the edge and man so always sticking it out there just doing doing what he did do what he did best he did his for and just got back into the pits um but the fia uh kind of sat there and was like uh, and it was a whole and it was a thing be, and it was uh, kind of a hit between no senna never won a world championship but he won a ton of races uh he won many of his 65 pole positions in this time because the car had so much power the reason why i'm saying is because lotus just released uh lotus and forza just released the uh lotus 97t and uh lotus really cut really was putting things on the edge the only thing is though after the 80s uh with the 99t and the 100t um kind of fall apart because uh, they went to Cosworth and other engines or Mugen or Honda or something like that and it never really worked out 
and I think they had Renault Mechachrome before they entered. They exited Formula One, I think, like 2002, 2003, I think. Um, but then there were some people that were sitting there going, well, this is a great formula, but it's also very expensive. And the, the racing back in those days was amazing because a lot of people were watching the World Sports Car Championship and were watching what was going on there with Porsche, um, Rondo, and um, Alpine, for that matter. And... Porsche was on its was, was trying to stomp its way to many overall victories back in the eighties. When I get to the group C part, when I get to the group C part in part three, you guys will see how how conquering that was, and um, it, it helped in so many ways because we if we didn't have turbocharging, uh, the Ford Sierra Cosworth the Ford Cosworths wouldn't have come out. Uh, we wouldn't have gotten. Uh, turbo Renaults in the late, mid to late eighties. I don't think we would have gotten some of the turbo Ferraris and stuff like that, and we wouldn't have gotten the uh, the three twenty eight, the the two eighty GTO, and sort of that like that in the late eighties. We wouldn't have gotten that. Um, in fact, we wouldn't even have gotten the F forty if if it wasn't for that. So, and it was kind of revitalized the sports car program, even though they never raced at Le Mans overall for like 50 years and then they finally won last year with the uh, 499p so remember that victory um so yeah and in the drivers always said um the drivers um the drivers always were hanging out just that one bit they would cool off their tires, and it's really interesting to watch. If you listen to uh, the commentary by um, by Gordon, uh, not Gordon Murray, but uh, by Murray Walker and and uh, the the infamous Playboy and womanizer James Hunt himself uh, talking about how lively the cars were and how they were catching these things going sideways half the time some of the driving that Sonny did in some of these cars even in wet conditions if there was one thing that these cars were good were for were they went to the Nurburgring sprint or if they went to Brands Hatch or if they went to Monza they were quick but man these things were cornering on rails and they were downforce factories this was because the cars were going so fast and because they were so light they were able to do it, and as the fuel burnt off during the race, and it was also quite a bit of a challenge to keep these cars uh, not on the road, but also keep them on the track because um, there were fuel economy limits. Now, this was back when Group, when the FIA was going to conservation mode with fuel, and was it not only a safety ground, it also was a strategy safety ground. It made the racing very interesting. So what would happen was, is, is uh, yeah, these turbos would be mega, and they'd be able to put a blinding lap and be seconds ahead of the field, especially Sarah, could be like two, three seconds ahead of the field and with this qualifying. But in the race, you had to conserve fuel. So if you went to, um, so if you went to Monza and well, if you didn't go to Monza, you went to. Uh, if you went to Monaco and you did like a 60 lap or a 70 lap, I forget how many laps Monaco has. I think it's like 75, 80 lap. I think it's like 65, 80, 65, 70 laps. I might be wrong. I might have to look that up, actually. How many laps is the Monaco Grand Prix? So the idea was to conserve fuel. Seventy laps. All right. So it's so you had to conserve uh, over a two point two point seven mile two point oh seven four mile track. Uh, that was one hundred sixty one miles to one hundred seventy seventy eight laps. So in an eighty lap, so in a seventy eight lap race, you had to conserve your fuel more mostly most like you have to do today to meet the distance and refueling. And the reason for that is so that the cars don't go all out from the start and 
they don't have these blinding qualifying times and the cars don't and the speeds don't rise they sort of want them to strategize and not go as fast so that they can get the speeds down not only that also try to keep things safe and that's kind of a big thing now with ferraris with, with the uh, cars now weighing almost i don't know almost um almost weighing 905 kilograms which is like 1990 pounds which is pretty heavy for a car and you also got to remember uh these things are going uh these things weigh 2000 pounds that wasn't the case back in the 1980s average formula one car back in the 1980s weighed about 14 to 1500 pounds so about 600 pounds less than a fully weighted Formula One car today, and delivering in qualifying mode, delivering three, two to three to four hundred horsepower more, and they were on tires that weren't as advanced, and they were aerodynamics that weren't plugged into the ground. They had no ground effect. Um, it was your right foot and your everything and your wits about you. So, and. So what happened was, is as you were burning off your, your, you had to plan your attack. So if you had a very fast car during the during qualifying, maybe you had less power during the race, so you had to, so you could use that to your advantage to move up the field. And some teams did that, and I'm pretty sure Senna had to do that. And I'm pretty sure Mansell and Prost, who ran for Ferrari, and McLaren had to do that. And it was, and it was um, Mansell and Prost who. And so Prost, who did most of the heavy lifting back in those days, because they were able to save their fuel because Senna, well, he either wrecked you out or crashed out or ran out of fuel because he was because he was quite the daredevil, but um, but he was spectacular to watch. So, uh, and there was and there was a radio transmission from your team said okay, and they would tell Mansell they'd be like oh Mansell oh, oh, Nigel. You, there's uh, 20 laps and there's 20 laps left in the left in the Grand Prix. You have to, you have 23 laps of fuel. You can push for it. <laughs> you can keep it keep it steady. But and then Senna would be in the back and he'd be like, you know, like and they'd be like and, and then Lotus would be like, oh Anton, you have you have 23 laps to go, but you only have 18 laps worth of fuel. Mansell would be able to keep on it. He'd be and he have a little extra. And you'd be able to use those extra eight laps versus versus Senna. He'd have to back off, and he would have to conserve fuel just to get the race distance. Because if you ran out of fuel, that was it. We're out of the Grand Prix, which happened a lot. Which happened to a lot of people because they didn't watch the fuel gauge. So, and eventually teams started getting around that, and they got the and made for some quite spectacular racing. And they just made sure that the cars were more aerodynamic and the cars were more efficient and some of these cars were very blunt nosed i mean if you look at the i mean if you look at the 511 the fw12 the fw uh 13 or 14 b and stuff like that i mean you'll see how blunt nosed that that williams is blunt nosed that williams is it's got the big schnoz on it just look it up. It's the the early the mid to late eighties um, Williams cars were absolutely monsters. Twelve hundred horsepower, twelve thirteen hundred horsepower qualifying, and just absolute beasts uh, of cars. Unfortunately, by 1987, 1988, um, the FIA sat there and said, "Well, well, what we're going to have to do?" I think it was by 19, was it 88? I think it was by 87 they started lessening turbo pressure. So um, so during race trim, the cars had around 750. During qualifying, they still had about 800, 900 horsepower. But during the racing, you had to have a certain amount of boost. So you had to 2.5 bar boost, which was 45 to 50 pounds of boost. And then by 1988... There was a there was rev limits. They had increased the weight of the cars, and teams started to um, figure out very fast that they had to uh, switch to normally aspirated engines, which was very good. Um, 
Cosworth came up with the HB. Uh, Williams was, Renault was coming up with the, um, with the RS um, style engines. And Ferrari was starting to come up with the V12. By 1989, 10 years after, about 12, 13 years after the turbo era was, um, was done. There was a lot of teething issues and stuff like that. And a lot of people, it was getting expensive. The main thing was safety. The other thing was cost. And the other thing was just how crazy the cars were getting and how much money they would have spent because the cars were getting faster and faster because the techno tire technology and aerodynamics were getting better. And, um, and they sort of responded in the late seventies, early eighties by, by smaller the wings, shortening the front end, taking a lot of downforce off the cars, making them harder to drive, making it more into the, um, and by this time, a lot of the cars were starting to get a lot of computer gizmos to make them more, um, make them more, uh, and this is kind of when, in 88, 90, 91, is when Senna started winning his world championships, and then he died in 94. Um, so yeah, and and the other thing was, is they were really complicated and at the beginning they were really complicated and they were really hard to keep under control because um, the one thing that a lot of teams were worried about was fuel, was the fuel content because in order to produce turbo pressure, you need to have decent fuel content. And they didn't have that. Renault had so many knocking issues, so many detonation issues, they were blowing pistons left and right. In this first in the six cylinder they were doing a lot and it was the same thing with the with the Renault six cylinder pulling pistons gearboxes turbos and stuff like that I'm not talking about in the race I'm talking about in qualifying and in the race so um, and they couldn't keep the engines cool because they because the turbo pressures and you gotta remember no intercoolers back then so they didn't quite come in because they didn't want to put more weight but unfortunately they had to put intercoolers and they had to do exhaust casts and they had to do wastegates so these cars could purr and once they perfected it it was good um and the cars sounded really cool i mean the the iconic sound of the williams and the renault and the honda the honda renault the honda williams and stuff like that eventually i eventually I think when normally aspirated V10s came back in the late 90s, um, the, uh, the Senna went to McLaren and they went to Honda, and then uh, the Williams guys went to the French to Renault with the, v, the three and a half liter V10 and stuff like that. And was it was it cool to watch? Well, I wasn't alive back then, but um, it was cool to watch these cars do what they did. Um, and I've watched a lot of the replays of these cars slipping and sliding, even in the wet. And they had no traction control. They had no stability control. They had no ADS. They had a manual gearbox, a clutch, and your right foot to control your power. And your only, and the only way and the only safety mechanism you had was your brain and your training and your determination and your driving skill. And balls of steel, pretty much. Um to keep these cars under control. Uh, and when they did get into a wreck, it was pretty spectacular. And that was the reason you're gonna, you're gonna see a trend about accidents uh, with uh, groups, with F1, uh, Group B and Group C, especially with Group C um, and Group B, well not Group B, but Group C. You're gonna see how, um, and how, you're gonna see how, um, you're going to see how F1 races put restrictions on engines and how we wouldn't see that overall crazy performance. I mean, it wasn't until like the late to mid 90s that things would start to simmer down after Senna's, Senna's accident. And things would, things would take like 10 years because it would ultimately, um, it would ultimate, the, the ultimate uh, V10 wouldn't show up until Renault had a 950 horsepower three liter v10 in the back of the um the r25 and the r20 uh the r24 and the r25 um 
and then eventually we get the turbo air, the turbo hybrid air with um, Mercedes and Red Bull right now. So, um, but yeah, you're going to see how uh, accidents and a lot of skullduggery ended up killing off, uh, and why they're why they changed everything. And after that, the the um, after that, the uh, the spending went down. They were actually able to control costs, and they were actually able to put, and that would kind of lead to the innovations for safety, like active suspension, automatic gearboxes. Uh, I'm pretty sure the paddle shift transmission would come out in the late '80s because they needed something to um, combat the engines. That was one thing that they that they could have used back in the late '70s, early '80s was the semi-automatic gearbox, even though pre-selected gearboxes had existed since the 30s since the 30s and 40s and Bugattis and um, Maseratis and Alfa Romeos and stuff like that so yeah um, but the but they perfected it and it's the reason why we have it in our road cars now and it's the reason why Ferrari does turbo cars in fact a lot of car, tur Ferrari's cars are now turbocharged because they're going back to their roots and the six cylinder that they have in the um, the three the the one the two ninety six the four ninety nine and a lot of the road cars is based on that uh, group C group B and Formula One derived uh, technology that has been coming up through the years. So you're going to see how road cars benefited as well. So while race fans lost out, the road cars that came after benefited much much more so yeah so i'll talk about group b next saturday um group b is um shorter shorter one but um i'm gonna fluff it up a little bit because because group b rallying was so hilarious deadly and stuff like that because i got to talk about lancia because i talk, talk about lancia peugeot the quattro audis and um, and, um, the, um, the turbo cars being in about five, 600 horsepower with these little 1.5 to 1.8 liter engines that they'd have and how, um, and how it would evolve to, um, and how the cars today would evolve into that. But I'll get to that part on next Saturday. Um, and I'll try to upload that episode a little, little, little sooner. This one's probably going to go up Sunday morning, but I don't care really. So, but yeah, I thought I'd give you guys a little, um, little synopsis on how crazy, um, how crazy uh, F1 was back then, and. It was around this time that Group uh, B was starting to get that, was starting to get that. And I think by the late 80s um, in Group C, we would start seeing the winning of those cars. And I think it was by 91, 92, we'd start seeing the three and a half liter formula come back because the FIA basically said, well, no turbos. And they put their hands on the reset button and said, no turbos, normally aspirated only. And, um, and you'd see how, uh, Group C sort of led to the, led to a rekindled, um, want in Formula One because of how expensive the world's most car. You're going to see how, how the, how all three of these formulas tripped over each other and basically caused a bomb that would basically throw sports cars into basically a kind of a dull dull spot in like the late seven late the late nineties, early late mid to late nineties and into the two thousands. I mean we wouldn't see a really, really cool um and yeah, we saw a couple of cool turbo cars. But it wouldn't be until the turn of the century with Audi that we'd actually start seeing sports car racing actually come in and figure that out. But I'll talk about that in the group C era. And how that relates to the new GTP hypercar uh, era that we have today. So, um, which I'm glad to be part of another cool museum. 
I'm part. I'm glad to be a part of the golden age of racing again. So, um, uh, and I think the Japanese Grand Prix is tomorrow. Almost. Actually, the Japanese Grand Prix is not tomorrow. I think it's actually on in a few in a few hours, in like half an hour. Japanese Grand Prix. One AM from Suzuka. Hey, good old the stepping up pole. Because McLaren and the Ferrari is not far behind. Alright everybody, I am going to the biggest one to do. I will let you guys know how the F one race went. I'm probably gonna watch highlights because I'm driving the race everything while it's while it's running. So um but yeah, thought you guys would enjoy the start of it um if you guys want to do research you guys want to read about the individual races and stuff like that you guys can read about that you can see some of the great pictures and go on youtube and see some of the great um see some of the footage of these cars just slipping and sliding in the wet and um and you can see some of the weird aerodynamic configurations in the late 70s early 80s they were really cool i mean a lot of cars had double wings on double wings to keep the cars keep the backs of these cars on the ground it was hilarious so um so yeah i'll see you guys um next saturday next saturday night for group b and the turbocharged craze 80s continues next weekend so see you guys then peace